morning. Welcome to day two of the workshop, Regulatory Utility of Mechanistic Modeling to Support Alternative Bioequivalence Approaches. And by, the, by good morning, I mean good afternoon or good evening, or wherever you may be. I understand we have many uh, participants from all over the globe. My name is James Polly. I'm a faculty member at the University of Maryland. I'm also co-director of the Center for Research on Complex Generics, which is a collaborative of the FDA, the University of Maryland, and the University of Michigan. As, the, as was the case yesterday, today's session is being recorded and will be available along with notes in about three weeks from now. You'll be able to obtain those, obtain those notes from our website, www.complexgenerics.org. Uh, we'll also email you when they become available. Uh, having said that, be sure to sign up on our listserv at the website, which I'll mention again, www.complexgenerics.org. Uh, for example, in the next week or so, we'll be announcing uh, the availability of an agenda for our November 30th meeting on long-acting injectables. So for those of you who are with us yesterday from day one, welcome back. For those of you who are able to join just for today, thanks for joining. Uh, the, as was the case yesterday, the agenda and bios are, bio booklet are available on the website, which again is www.complexgenerics.org. Uh, yesterday focused on mechanistic modeling of orally inhaled generic products, dermal generic drug products, and other locally acting generic drug products. Today, we pivot towards oral uh, PPPK applications, as well as model acceptance and model sharing for regulatory utility. Again, the agenda is on the website. Uh, today's agenda in general has an opening session, as well as uh, three uh, uh, sessions, substantive uh, detailed sessions. Like yesterday, please, please feel free to enter questions into the chat. This is a valuable part of the workshop, we think. If you think you uh, if you think you can help us out in directing your question to a particular person, although that's, that's not necessary, for example, a particular lecturer, uh, please uh, send the chat to everyone so everyone can see. But then maybe add their name at the start of your chat, like at uh, Dr. So and so. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Sally Cho, who giving some opening remarks. Um, I think. She Probably for this audience, she doesn't need an introduction, as is probably the case for really all of our lecturers today. Uh, Dr. Cho serves as a director of uh, OGD. Um, as you know, the office is responsible for reviewing and approving all and applications. I think workshop participants will appreciate her being a pharmaceutical scientist with great technical expertise in, in the topics of, uh, of uh, the workshop uh, prior to rejoining FDA as OGD director. She served as senior director of Pyrexcel International Corporation, overseeing the Asia Pacific region and Japan offices, as well as managing the global vice president technical consultant groups. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cho. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us again for the second day of our workshop with the Center for Research on Complex Generics. I'm so appreciative of this collaboration and the opportunity it provides us to do things exactly like today's workshop. As you know, the generic drug industry and FDA made a visionary decision during Group 1 negotiations to provide direct support for science and research. This funding is helping making the, the development of generic drugs easier and the review of generic drug applications more efficient by proactively addressing emerging scientific and regulatory challenges. The scientific research funded by the GRUPA program builds an essential bridge from the scientific knowledge of the 20th century to enable generic drug developers to use more efficient 21st century technologies. GRUPA funded research has accelerated scientific and technical advances for generics, modernized evidence-based bioequivalent standards, and helped ensure that the regulatory concepts are comparable with the innovation in drug development that have occurred across the last several decades. The GRUFA Science and Research Program enables FDA to address complex scientific issues for product-specific guidance development and to communicate with the applicants through pre-NDA meeting 
is to help clarify regulatory expectations for prospective applicants early in the generic drug development cycle. These early communications can help reduce a generic drug product's time in the pipeline from concept to development to market by assisting generic drug applicants in developing more com complete application submissions. Complex products for which an alternative bioequivalence approach supported by modeling and simulation may be appropriate can be eligible for a pre and product development meeting, which can help ad address uh, questions that arise during product development. Given the novelty of these approaches, direct conversation between an applicant and FDA can lead to more streamlined and focused end submissions and fewer review cycles. And for non-complex products, utilizing modeling and simulation as an alternative by one's approach, pre and engagement is also possible. Let me share some real life examples of a model supported by Kubun's recommendation for complex and non-complex products with you. OGD internal research on using model integrated evidence for generic products and effort has led to generic drug approvals such as generic diclofenac uh, sodium topical gel 1%. This is a successful example of the utilization of novel quantitative tools and modeling in support of an alternative by Kuhn's approach for dermatological generic drug products. In this case, PVPK modeling supported a more efficient and less costly alternative by Kuhn's approach. Modeling and simulation approaches hold promise to support global harmonization efforts in key areas such as alternatives to fed by Kuhn studies for immediate release products, by Kuhn's evaluation of long acting injectable and implants, and by equivalence assessment of orally inhaled products. FDA in general recommends fasting and fed in vivo by equivalence study for immediate release of drug products to address the question whether alternative approaches can be used in lieu of in vivo fed by equivalence study. Modelers are using PBPK modeling and simulation to assess the need for by equivalence B studies as part of the by equivalence regulatory program. This effort may support the use of alternative approaches instead of fed by equivalent studies for low risk IR drug products and supports the harmonization efforts in developing the ICH M13 guideline on by equivalent standards for IR dosage form drugs. One of the greatest challenges to the development of complex generics as reported to FDA by industry and stakeholder feedback is an uncertainty about how to implement scientific insights from generic drug research in a manner consistent with FDA's regulatory expectations. The CRCG plays a vital role in addressing these challenges by supporting FDA's efforts to enhance research collaborations with the generic industry. It's also a venue through which industry can provide input on prioritization of research efforts, impacting development and assessment of certain types of generic drug products with FDA. In fact, a recent survey con conducted by the CRCG identified mechanistic modeling to be the primary analytic, a prime analytic tool of interest to the industry. And therefore, a central purpose of today's workshop is to facilitate communication between the FDA and generic industry stakeholders on how to incorporate modeling and simulation approaches into their submissions to FDA. This collaboration can occur both in the pre and the meeting space as industry values possible new bioequivalence uh, approaches and in the end submission space where modeling is a part of evidence provided to demonstrate by equivalence. So again, this is exactly why events like these are so exciting to us. I greatly appreciate FDA and CRCG staff for putting this working, uh, workshop together and all of you for joining us today. And we look forward to continuing this important work in the future. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Cho.
Our next speaker, uh, again, is someone who I think needs no introduction, William Jesko. Dr. Jesko is a SUNY Distinguished Professor and former Chair of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Buffalo. He was the 2018 Oscar Hunter Career Award winner from ASCPT and the 2020 Distinguished Pharmaceutical Science Award winner from AAPS. Um, maybe I'll try to tell you something that you may not know, but probably you could guess. He, I think he's also a Buffalo Bills fan. It is autumn here and it's a Friday, so we think about football. And uh, here in Baltimore, we uh, are keeping a keen eye on the Buffalo Bills. So I will say go Bills uh, with regard to Dr. Jesko. And I should also say uh, happy Purple Friday here from Baltimore, Dr. Jesko. Uh, thank you for uh, lecturing today, Dr. Jesko. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present some of my perspectives on PBPK modeling. I'm going to talk about ways that many of them can be improved. First, I'd like to note that both Sertera and Simulations Plus provides us with complementary software for doing PBPK modeling. There's many approaches to extrapolation. I indicate some of them here. I'm going to focus on PK using PVPK models that are enhanced with in vitro binding and drug metabolism studies. We owe a great debt to Bischoff and Dietrich. They popularized PVPK modeling back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they indicated the great advantages to taking this approach. They provided equations such as the one you see here for liver concentrations. What they did was essentially bring together fixed law of perfusion, adding metabolism and renal excretion for clearance, and created what is equivalent to the well stirred model. The well stirred model itself, also known as the venous equilibrium model, was popularized by Roland and Wilkinson and co workers. This assumes blood flow coming into the organ, rapid equilibration throughout drug leaving with the venous concentration and metabolism happening with the term intrinsic clearance. So they provided equations such as hepatic clearance being blood flow times extraction ratio and hepatic clearance being blood flow intrinsic clearance with the FUP term. So the fraction unbound in plasma involves the assumption that the free drug hypothesis applies. That is free drug in plasma that equilibrates with free drug in the hepatocytes to provide clearance. I'm going to assume at this meeting you're hearing a great number of advantages and opportunities for doing PVPK modeling. So all of them probably great. I'm going to consider at least a dozen uh, situations that need to be thought about in case your models are not working perfectly. First of all, there's a great number of models for the liver. Uh, this review shows 13 of them. The two we focus on are at the top. So the well stirred model I just described, parallel tube model developed by Winkler and co-workers, uh, reflects an exponential drop in concentrations between the inflow and outflow. So both models can start with the kind of equation I've shown before. And the well stirred model assumes that intrinsic clearance is acting upon uh, C out. Well, parallel tube model assumes that intrinsic clearance is acting upon the log mean concentration instead of C out. Both approaches can involve a partition coefficient for liver plasma ratios and the blood plasma ratio as well. Many investigators have examined the applicability of these models for IVIBE. Houston and co-workers looked at a lot of data in humans. In vitro intrinsic clearances were determined in hepatocytes or microsomes. In vivo intrinsic clearances were calculated based on whole body clearance or hepatic clearance. So the equations at the bottom were used. So when they make the comparisons, they see generally a good correlation. 
High clearances in vitro predict high clearances in vivo, vice versa. Low clearances, low clearances. However, there's an appreciable uh, disturbance from the line of identity. Uh, there's an underprediction. Basically, the in vitro values uh, underpredict what's happening in vivo. So the search has been for ways to improve. And I'll show some of the reasons why they may not. First of all, drug metabolism can take place in many tissues. This graph is showing four for intrinsic clearances in rat tissues. Of course, the liver dominates, but this drug can undergo oxidation in a great number of tissues in the body. Metabolism by other tissues is not often looked at. Reversible metabolism is a complication. Uh, this slide shows our data where methylprednisolone was dosed. And on the left, you see when methylprednisolone is given, methylprednisone, a metabolite, is formed. On the right, you see when methylprednisone, the metabolite, is dosed, get formation of a lot of the parent drug. So give drug, you see the metabolite. Give metabolite, you see the drug. This is a reversal of metabolism. And the kinetics of this requires four clearances. Further, when you consider dose over AUC, if you think you're calculating one clearance, for this system, it's actually a combination of four clearances. This slide shows a review of an array of compounds undergoing reversal of metabolism. You see many structures of types of compounds, many metabolic processes, and a great number of examples besides corticosteroids that undergo reversal of metabolism. So unless you dose a metabolite, you may not know that reversal of metabolism is occurring. A similar phenomenon happens when Drugs are secreted into the GI tract or undergo biliary excretion. They can all undergo enteropathic circulation. So this review article points out uh, many of these processes. And the situation is much like reversal of metabolism. You may not know what's happening unless you have an experiment that can determine that it is occurring. For example, collection of bile. So this is an underappreciated phenomenon. There's a lot of attention being paid to transporters. This slide is showing the transporters associated with hepatocytes. And what I want to point out is the effect it has on the calculations that we do. The equation for hepatic clearance becomes the one where you need to add an influx clearance and an efflux clearance if either or both of these phenomena are occurring. So transporters complicate assessment of pharmacokinetics. You may not know they are occurring unless there's additional experimental data that points the way towards this. Transporters also affect partition coefficients. Low permeability needs special consideration. This slide from Zhang et al. is showing the basic PVPK equation with an added term FD where FD for the two models incorporates the permeability surface area coefficient. They looked at a number of compounds with low to high permeability. For example, furosemide has low permeability, rapamil very high. And what they found in assessing the pharmacokinetics in rats was that for compounds with low permeability, the Perfusion limited model does not work as well as these models that include permeability. The more traditional approach to dealing with permeability is a more complex model that's found in many PBPK programs. So here, the organ is divided into capillary space, interstitial space, and cell water space. And permeability is assumed to influence the distribution between interstitial fluid and cell water spaces. So you need more information about the tissues. You need a, two differential equations. And you need assigned or fitted PS values in order to implement this model. Many PPPK studies 
involve IV doses where the assumption is that C0 is dose divided by blood volume or plasma volume. This slide is showing antipyrine concentrations in the minute after right atrial injection of the drug. So one sees this waveform. So it takes a minute before the initial circulation uh, results. Later, you see the, the typical poly exponential decline in the drug concentrations. Arterial and venous concentrations may differ. This slide is showing three drugs, arterial concentrations in red, venous concentrations blue. And we see that during the first minute or hour, there can be a marked difference. So what's the importance of this? It's more important for pharmacodynamics. And what's interesting is if you consider the structure of the liver and splanchnic uh, setup in PBK models, we can appreciate that the liver is getting about 80% of its blood from the portal vein. This is probably fortuitous because the portal vein concentrations are probably much like the antecubital vein concentrations if there's no GI metabolism. So red blood cell equilibration is seldom assessed. When is it important? Let's look at red cell transit times. This is an indicator dilution study in perfused rat liver. Uh, biomarkers were used for four entities. And if you look at red blood cells and albumin, we see that the, these compounds traverse the rat liver in less than two minutes. So red cell equilibration has to be really fast uh, to not be important in, as a factor in these models. Uh, let's consider albumin as well. Albumin is a rapid transit time. And there's a couple complications with albumin. Uh, this published study shows predicted versus in vivo measured hepatic clearances of our number of drugs that are subjected to uh, transporter uptake. And one sees the appreciable uh, separation from the line of identity. These authors developed a, a, a cold meth a method of using reduced temperature to basically knock out uh, transport clearance and albumin mediated clearance in order to take account for this factor. So on the right, when they made their predictions based on uh, these, this correction factor, they found much closer agreement for all of these compounds. So albumin-mediated uptake can sometimes happen with some drugs. Albumin binding, protein binding can have exhibit another problem. This slide from Baker and Parton shows a model where there's a K on and K off of drug binding to proteins in plasma. They carried out a literature review and some experimental assessments. And the graph that's shown led them to the observation that observed hepatic uptake was between total and free drug. Basically, a fast K off allows tissue uptake of presumed unbound drug. These studies were followed by a review by Bowman and Bennett, who concluded some highly bound ligands have more efficient uptake than can be explained by their unbound fraction. So we kindly, we often use FUP in our models based on the free drug hypothesis. Keep in mind, there are exceptions to the free drug hypothesis as indicated in the past two slides. When in vitro assessment of intrinsic clearance is done, a correction is made for nonspecific binding. Basically, the hepatocytes, microsomes, uh, tissue homogenates are dilutions of the original tissue. And when carrying out the metabolic studies, uh, free, measurement of free drug is also done. And it's assumed to be nonspecific binding. And a correction is made for the expected nonspecific binding if, if the tissue preparation was undiluted. 
Well, we made an assessment of, of this relationship and the graph on the left is, is expected to show that the CFU correction needs linear binding and it's most accurate at low drug concentrations and at high protein concentrations. So these conditions are not always fulfilled. You can't always trust measurements of nonspecific binding. Next is prediction of tissue partition coefficients. So the poulan thiel method and others involve use of uh, octanol water partition coefficients, FUP in plasma, volume fraction of lipids, phospholipids in albumin, and provides a way of, of prediction of KP values. This current slide shows the ability of various methods to predict KP values for a variety of drugs and tissues. And what we see is that in general, there's decent correspondence. High calculated values predict high experimental values. Low values predict low values. However, the concordance is not perfect. Uh, one can't, won't necessarily get exact values. Some of the po data points are well away from the line of identity. So these predictions are approximate. They also do not account for transporters or d d disagreements with the free drug hypothesis. Next, understanding what's happening within tissues is of growing importance. We developed a model for chloroquine based on published data that you see on the graph. So after a dose of chloroquine in rats, plasma concentrations are very low. All of the tissue concentrations are far higher. And look at the blue dots. Liver concentrations are roughly 100-fold higher than plasma concentrations. Well, we employed a PBPK model in two stages. First, characterizing these data with the general model, as you see on the graph and then using the model to calculate what might be happening within each tissue. So for this, we use the uh, Houston extension of the rogers rowland method for prediction of KP values for lipophilic weak bases. So the model for this is shown. You see equilibration between plasma, interstitial fluid, and cytosol. You see binding to the various lipids. And of importance, you see the lysosome compartment. So lysosomes constitute between 1 and 10% of tissue volumes. Lysosomes have a very low pH, around 5. So if you have a lipophilic weak base that can get into cells, will be highly ionized, they will then sequester into the lysosomes. So our modeling showed the concentrations that you see in the graph. Plasma concentrations are the green line. The original liver concentrations are in black. The expected lysosome concentrations are on top in blue. So what we're seeing, lysosome concentrations that are a thousandfold higher than plasma concentrations. So it produced some marked distortion of what's expected to be happening within the cells. This kind of modeling is supported by imaging or needs imaging and involves a variety of assumptions that, that may or may not be relevant. Lastly, we take many approaches to doing pharmacokinetics. A common starting point is non-compartmental analysis where we can use AUC and AUMC to calculate clearance and steady state lima distribution. Many times mammillary models are used. Uh, they are sort of empirical because we often don't have a true appreciation of what those tissue compartments mean. Well, the ideal that we seek is a full PVPK model with complete mechanism-based components. Sometimes we can settle for an intermediate approach, minimal PVPK models. So these models have a physiological structure. The uh, Rapidly perfused tissues and slowly perfused tissues are 
are divided, uh, but they can be very useful and as has been shown for a great number of compounds. These models might often suffice for many types of applications. For example, if you want to describe the central kinetics with this model and then add on, for example, a special method of dosing the drug. So keep in mind, one doesn't always need the full complexity. So where we're at, basic PVP models have served well to understand integration of kinetic and physiological functions. Prediction methods utilizing in vitro assessed drug properties are helpful, but only approximate. Numerous complexities in PBPK need better enhanced consideration. And then one should augment PBPK with rigorous verification. How you do this is another story, uh, but, but try, try to do so. Finally, with PBPK modeling, the pot of gold still awaits us in seeking perfection, but the journey is highly worthwhile. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jesko, for your keynote address. Uh, for those who just joined us a little late, uh, please be reminded that today's session, like yesterday, is being recorded. These recordings, as well as lecture notes, will be available in about three weeks at the website www.complexgenerics.org. We will email you when it becomes available. And again, please also be sure to sign up for the uh, CRCG listserv uh, such that, for example, in a week or so from now, we'll be putting out an email about the November 30th workshop on long acting injectables. Also, like yesterday, please feel free to enter questions into the chat box. Uh, in doing so, if you happen to know who you think might uh, be a good person to address your question, feel free when typing into everyone, uh, adding their name in the very beginning of your, of your text. I'm pleased to introduce Li Zhang, who will give an overview of day two. Uh, Li Zhang is Deputy Director of the Office of Research and Standards. And I think as described yesterday, the Office of Research and Standards implements the Jadu for science and research commitments to ensure the therapeutic equivalence of generic drug products. Dr. Zhang has contributed to the numerous guidance development and research projects focused on the science based regulatory decision making, including drug drug interactions, specific populations, and PVPK modeling. Uh, thanks for giving a day two overview, Dr. Zhang. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. I also would like to thank Dr. Sally Chu for her opening remarks today. And we just heard Dr. Professor Bill Jesko for the keynote speech on opportunities for PVPK modeling enhancement. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending day two of the FDA CRCG workshop on regulatory utility of mechanistic modeling to support alternative bioequivalence approaches. Yesterday, we discussed the locally acting PBPK and CFD modeling for complex products. Today, we will have two symposia. One symposium, the first one, will focus on oral PBPK modeling with three sessions. Session one will cover oral PBPK as an alternative B approach and a tool for supporting risk assessment and bio waiver. In session two, we will discuss oral PBPK for evaluating the impact of food on BE. And the third session of the symposium will discuss challenges and successful cases for oral PBPK. We all know oral drug products is one of the major product types um, in all drug products. An advancement made in the oral PBPK modeling will not only facilitate generic drug development by enabling more efficient B approaches, but also it would have an impact on our global harmonization. Study.
states, including FDA, industry, CRO, and academia. So we look forward to the exciting discussion in the symposium. The second symposium today actually will be very interesting. We'll cover a novel and interesting topic by introducing the concept of model master file, along with discussion on model acceptance and model sharing for regulatory use. Analogous to drug master files, there's a perceived benefit of model master files in helping generic drug development and beyond. Questions such as, can we use have model master files and who will be developing them and who will be the host of those model master files? How can they be used or shared for drug development and the regulatory assessment purposes? All these interesting topics or questions will be discussed and debated among regulatory and non-regulatory speakers and panelists today. Important regulated questions will be discussed throughout the sessions and also the workshop. We look forward to your active participation. In each session, you will hear a series of pre-recorded presentations. Please note that those presentations will play in succession with no interruption, and the times you saw on the agenda are a rough estimate uh, of each presentation. After all the presentations are being done for each session, there will be a live Q&A um, panel discussion. And each panel discussion will be moderated by two moderators, one from regulatory side and the other from the non-regulatory side. And we, as Jim mentioned, we encourage you to post your questions or comments in the chat box to everyone so we all can see your questions. But if you have a specific question, for a specific person, you can type their name in front of question with the at. And we also ask you to enter question as early as possible so they can be reviewed and vetted by our moderators to be um, uh, discussed, incorporated into the panel discussion. Um, presentations and panel discussion are all recorded and they will be available uh, a few weeks later after the workshop and you want to follow the CRCG email and website for updates. I would like to thank all the speakers, panelists, as well as the, um, as well as the um, presenters and pe uh, workshop planning committee members for this significant amount of work efforts in preparing this workshop. And I hope you will also enjoy the day two of the workshop. With that, I will, we will begin the first session of the workshop of day two, and I will turn back to you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Leigh. As Leigh indicated, uh, the session lead for session one today is Fang Wu. Dr. Wu is a senior pharmacologist reviewer and scientific lead for oral uh, PPBK modeling in the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling. She is responsible for using modeling and simulation tools for reviewing pre and meeting packages and a cons consults and control correspondence. Um, so much thanks, uh, uh, Fang, from all of us, all the participants today, as well as myself for all your efforts in making uh, this workshop possible. Thank you, Fang. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce the speakers for session one. Oral PPK as alternative B approach and a tool for supporting risk assessment and the bioweaver. We have four speakers for this session. First speaker, Dr. Fang Wu, is a senior pharmacologist and a scientific lead at the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling, ORS OGD. The second speaker, Dr. Kimberly Rings, is a supervisory pharmacologist and the brand chief at the Division of Biopharmaceutics, Office of New Drug Products, OPQ. Dr. Rings develops CEDAR biopharmaceutical guidances, leads research projects within her division, and provides subject matter expertise to FDA policy initiatives. The third speaker, Dr. Chris Bolt, is the Vice President of Scientific and Corporate Communications at Absorption Systems. 
Dr. Bolt has been a study director related to numerous BCS-based bioweavers and transporter studies and directs or provides scientific input into various research projects, grants, and contracts. The fourth speaker, Dr. Yu Chunzhang, is the Chief Scientific Officer in Biopharmaceutics and Biostatistics at Apple Tax. Dr. Zhang's main responsibilities are to provide pharmacokinetic and statistical advices in preparing protocol and study report for pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and clinical studies of complex drug and biosimilar products and in the design of bioequivalence clinical endpoint studies and analysis of data for the development of traditional drug products. Follow the four presentations, there will be a panel discussion. The moderators are Dr. Hongling Zhang and Dr. Taiko Hembe. Dr. Zhang is the acting division director of the Division of Bioequivalence II, Office of Bioequivalence, OGD. Dr. Zhang has been involved in evaluating bioequivalence submissions in ANDS for many complex drug products and BE studies with complex scientific and regulatory issues. Dr. Heimberg recently joined Merck in the Biopharmaceutics and Specialty Dosage Group, where he serves as a biopharmaceutics expert in oral and parenteral drug development. Prior to that, Dr. Heimberg was at Novartis, where he led a global PBPK modeling group in DMPK and served as PBPK and a biopharmaceutics expert. Now let's turn our attention to the presentations. <laughs> 